Okay, this is chapter three review, video review. We're going to break chapter three into uh, a couple sections. Chapter three is the macromolecules, and the first part is just a general introduction. So macromolecules means large molecule. The examples we talk about in class are proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. These are the large molecules that make up all living organisms. Most of these are polymers, which means they're large molecules made up of repeated subunits called monomers. Mono means one. These are the units that are repeated. And uh, the proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids are all polymers. Okay, so macromolecules are large molecules. Macro means large. And if we look at these examples on the bottom, these are polymers made up of repeated subunits okay, linked together. And what gives us different types of molecules is how we build those building blocks together, how we link those mo monomers together. Now these polymers are held together by specific bonds called covalent bonds. And a covalent bond, remember, is a strong bond that means a sharing of electrons. And so um, the proteins are held together by bonds um, between the amino acids. So amino acids are the building blocks. They come together through covalent bonds to create proteins. And more specifically, they're held together by peptide bonds. Carbohydrates are the building blocks for, uh, the building blocks for carbohydrates are monosaccharides. So mono means one, saccharides are sugars. So these come together to form either uh, individual carbohydrates, I mean, by themselves they form carbohydrates, but if you link them together, many of them, we create mon uh, polysaccharides. Poly means many. And then for nucleic acids, the building blocks are nucleotides. Okay, these three here, proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, these are all polymers. Lipids, they're not polymers, but they're large molecules that have a distinct structure as well, and we'll see these later. Before we can look at each of these macromolecules in more detail, we need to see some characteristics of molecules in general that give them discrete functions. So all of these molecules of life, they're made up of repeated building blocks. So how do you get such a variety of different types of molecules if you only have a limited number of building blocks? Well, you add to specific um, groups to them called functional groups. These are small little parts of molecules that can be added to them to give them specific functions. So they're called functional groups. Okay, They're bound to the molecule covalently, and they determine its, the molecule's function and its shape and how it behaves chemically. If we look here in the purple box or outline box, there's some molecule and it has this group added to it in the yellow box. That's the functional group. Okay, so this is what's going to help provide a function or the um, chemical properties of this molecule. All right, so you need to know these functional groups listed on these slides. I'm just going to go over them briefly here and I'll allow you to go back to your slides from class or your notes to learn more of the details. Okay, so for each one of these, I want you to know the functional group, the class of compounds, and be able to recognize it. Okay, so the first one's hydroxyl. And that's just an OH, an oxygen and a hydrogen. The name tells you that hydro and oxygen, hydrogen and oxygen, hydroxyl. This creates alcohols. And all this is is an O and an H added to some molecule, and it gives it a unique property that makes it an alcohol. The class of compounds called alcohols. The next group's an aldehyde. It's just a carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. More specifically, that carbon is double bond to the oxygen, two covalent bonds to the oxygen, and one covalent bond to the hydrogen. This creates an aldehyde. And you see the name is acetaldehyde, so the name kind of tells you we're talking about an aldehyde. Also look at carbon. Remember, each carbon is bound to four other, can participate in four covalent bonds. So you count the solid lines, those are covalent bonds. There's one, two, three, and four for this carbon, right? The next functional group is a keto. This creates a group of compounds called ketones. This is a w internal functional group. So you have the molecule, the functional group is actually found within it. So here's a carbon double bound to an oxygen. That's a ketone. Example, acetone. So you see the name tone is telling you it's a ketone. The next two functional groups are important because we see them uh, in many molecules, but specifically we'll find both of these in proteins. The first one's called a carboxyl group, COOH. Its name is a carboxylic acid. And if you look at a molecule, 
when you find the functional group of a uh, carboxyl, it's a carbon double bound to an oxygen and also bound to a hydroxyl, an O and an H. Okay, that's a carboxylic acid. Down here is amino, amine. This means, uh, whenever you see amino or amine or ammonia, words that sound like this, they're usually talking about nitrogen. So this is the only functional group we'll learn about that has nitrogen in it. And it's uh, NH2. Okay. And so here's an example, if you look at the diagram of N double or uh, bound to two hydrogens. So that's the amino group. And I said these are important because we'll see them in proteins. We said proteins are built, made from building blocks called amino acids. This means they have an amine group and an acid group. So amino acids. Okay. Here we have uh, phosphate and sulfhydryl groups. Phosphate is O, P, O, 3. You see it here, O for oxygen. It has a negative 2 charge. I just want to give it some important properties. And then sulfhydryl. This is just S and H. So sulfur and hydrogen. It gives a class of molecules called thiols. You see SH. Right? Now you can remember these two because the phosphate group is the only one with phosphorus. The sulfhydryl group is the only one with sulfur. And we'll see these are very important, give molecules very important properties, um, and we'll explain examples of them later in the chapter. Now when we have molecules, they come in different shapes or different arrangements, and these are called isomers. And there's two types of isomers, structural isomers and optical isomers. On the left here, we have structural isomers. What that means is these two molecules, butane and isobutene, have the exact same chemical formulas but the arrangement of their atoms are different. So you see butane is a straight line of carbons. Isobutane is a branched line of carbons. Okay, so it has three here and then one above it. Butane, there's all four carbons in a row. An optical isomer, if you look at this closely, they're mirror images of each other. So it's a molecule and they're mirror images. So an example I use in class is if you think of a hand scanner, if you put your hand in a, a reader, say to enter through a door, it'll scan your right hand. It recognizes that that's you. Now if you take your left hand, which is a mirror image of your right hand, and you put it in that hand reader, it won't recognize you. Okay, Even though your hands look the same structurally, they're just mirror images of each other. They're optical isomers of each other. If you apply this to our cells, on the surface of our cells, there's receptors that recognize a certain shaped molecule. And if you have an optical isomer of that optic, uh, molecule, it won't land in that receptor appropriately. So this is important understanding medications, understanding signal molecules inside our cells, how they bond to the surface and send signals or their other functions, whatever it might be. Now the last part here of this intro to chapter 3 is the types of reactions. So we're talking about macromolecules, so we need to know how to make them and we know, know how to break them. We're talking about making macromolecules. These are This is called a synthesis because you're making something. And there's two names for it, so condensation or dehydration reaction. These names is kind of confusing. There's two names, but they're similar. Now, condensation, if you think of a glass that has condensation around it, this is water from the environment kind of forming on the outside of the glass. And dehydration means losing water also. So if you think about the cup, the water's formed on it. It's kind of been the air's been dehydrated. Water's been pulled out of the air. Now it's on the cup. Now when we perform a synthesis reaction, a condensation or a dehydration reaction, we're making something. We're making a macromolecule. They're made up of subunits. So if you look at this diagram here, there's two subunits. We're going to join them together. And when we do, we pull out a water. Here's an O and H, and here's a second H. That's H2O. We remove it from these monomers. And we create, we're starting to create a large molecule. So these two, when we link them together, these two monomers, we're pulling out a water. So water, these two subunits have been dehydrated. They've lost the water. Or water's been formed, which is condensation. Okay. So now our molecule is two subunits long. If we add a third subunit to it, it's going to be the same sort of reaction, a condensation or dehydration reaction. We're going to pull out another water, and now we have a subunit that's a molecule that's three subunits long. This can be repeated to make subunits that are four or five subunits long. Or we can make molecules that are thousands of units long or longer. So you can remember dehydration or uh, condensation, that's making large molecules. Now the opposite of that, or breaking down large molecules, this is called hydrolysis. And if you think of the term lysis, this means to break. 
Okay, so if we have a big molecule, we're going to break it. It's being lysed. That's one way to think about it. And what happens is as you break off one subunit at a time, we have to put water back. So when we made this, we created water. And now as we break it down, we have to put water back into it. So this is called hydrolysis. If you look at the word hydrolysis, again, it really is hydrolysis. Hydro for water, lysis breaking, so water breaking. So we're taking this water and we're breaking it and putting it back into the subunits. Okay, so it's essentially the opposite of the synthesis reactions we just saw. So hy hydrolysis is, you can think lysis for breaking down a large molecule. You can think hydrolysis for breaking water and putting it back. And this is carried out in a series of steps. And we can break them off one at a time until it's completely broke down. So why do you need to know condensation reactions and hydrolysis reactions? Well, we think of a large molecule like a protein. When you eat it, you have to break it down one piece at a time into its individual building blocks, amino acids. All right? Then inside our body, we have to make proteins, so we have to take these individual pieces and put them back together. Okay? And that's the dehydration reactions. And so this overall, together, hydrolysis reactions and um, dehydration reactions is breaking down and building things. This is how we have our metabolism, the sum reactions in our body. So that's just a basic intro to chapter three. Um, the subsequent um, video reviews will be each of the macromolecules that we learned about.